Well, welcome back. I can't do it, man. <laughs> welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts and philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. The, re- the reason that I'm breaking up here, I got two of my, my close friends from, from grade school and high school, and they're looking at me right now, and it's super awkward uh, <laughs> to try and be professional with them on. But uh, today I have two more special guests with me. So uh, this is a podcast about philosophy, theology, nature, and life. Today is a life section. We're going to be talking about chiropractic. We're going to be talking about health and lifting weights. And so I have with me uh, Dr. Kevin McGarry and Dr. Ryan Pokrivka. And they both uh, insist on being called doctor. You know, they say we, we worked really hard for it, so you better call us. And so uh, without further uh, ado here, these are the guys. What's up, dudes? Yeah, what's up? How's it going? So you guys are both doctors of chiropractic, um, but that's not a real serious doctor, is it? Like, like uh... <laughs> I mean, honestly, we, you know, to be fair, we don't insist on anybody calling us doctor. Like, we, we that's are not doctors. What you told me. That's not what you told me. You said make sure everyone knows yeah. we're doctors. So. We're a minute and twenty into this, and you're already lying to the, to the fans. <laughs> out there, so that's questionable. But um, no, we. I mean, yeah, we are doctors, but. Again, it's like, you know, I don't, I don't, it's weird to think of myself as a doctor. It's like, I don't know. We worked hard for our degree and everything, but I just like to think we help people, you know? Yeah. Or we let, we let our dogs bark in the background of podcasts. Yeah, I guess well, that's, bad. that's good. Thanks, Kev. Uh, yeah, man. So I, I, for the audience, um, I am joking because I know these dudes. These are two of my best friends and I know what they went through in school and all the classes that they had to go through. And I was surprised each time. Because uh, I'm like, yeah, I don't know, you're, you're like a backcracker, you know? And then hearing all the classes that you guys had to go through, can you guys uh, share with us like some of the stuff that you guys had to learn to become a, a doctor of chiropractic? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll go through kind of like, I'll kind of split it into years. So chiropractic school is, uh, if you stay on the full track, it's 10 trimesters and it basically goes straight through the year. Um, and it's about anywhere from 24 to 28 credit hours per trimester. So the first year of that is kind of your basic sciences. So it's head to toe uh, anatomy dissection. So we're taking brains out, dissecting brains. On on human cadavers. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. It was pretty nasty. (laughs) It was was honestly like first week, like I was like, what am I doing here? Like I was like, this is going to be kind of crazy. But then like, dude, when you're in there, you're just like, it's pretty, it's it's interesting. And so like you start, you kind of just like become desensitized the fact that you're like sticking your hands inside of a human being. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, it's just like, I don't know, you, you kind of tone, t- tune that out and you just start like learning and you're like, this is, it's actually really interesting mm-hmm. and cool. It's not yeah, as gross as it sounds. Experience. I, I could see Rye being desensitized within the first 30 seconds. And just, <laughs> just, just juggling brains. I think, I think the first day we like took the skin off their face and that was pretty much after that I was fine with everything. <laughs> yeah. During, during visceral anatomy, I can, I can clearly remember at that point we were three trimesters in and we had dissected a lot of the body. We had a human heart in our hands and we're like, like tossing it around. It was no. <laughs> it was well, that's pretty wild. Okay. So you, I, you cut that out of the, the podcast. No, no, not cutting it. <laughs> no, but anyway, so, so that was our first year was um, first year was a ton of basic sciences. So tons of anatomy, tons of physiology, uh, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, basically learn how the brain works, how it connects to our body. Um, biochemistry, so basically all the different pathways and energy systems that kind of help our body do the things that it does. Um, nutrition, nutritional biochemistry, all those types of classes are kind of in the first year. The second year, and, and then you take board exams for, for all that information. The second year is a little bit more clinical applications. So you learn things like, all right, let's learn how to do like a cranial nerve exam for someone who you know might have a, a brain condition or something like that, or how to do a physical exam, like an orthopedic workup of the knee or something like that. A- anything that you're going to potentially see in practice, you actually do the hands-on like clinical application. So you learn a lot of pathologies, you learn a lot of uh, tests and correlations and things like that. Um, that's kind of all the second year. And then about halfway through the second year, you start doing a lot more clinical experiences. So you start with like simulated patient encounters. So you sit down with a patient, you have to take a history with them, um, basically come to a diagnosis, and then you're kind of graded on how well you did, you're, you're filmed and all that stuff. Um, 
And then going into the third year, it's mostly seeing patients at that point. So you're trained in all the hands-on therapies, you're trained in the history taking, you have all the basic sciences background, and then um, you're, you're seeing patients under the license of a practicing chiropractor. So is that like an internship type type thing then? Basically, a lot of people a lot of people compare it to like a residency, oh, but yeah, okay. a year long instead of you know two years. And you have to clock a certain amount of hours in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you remember what that was? Ooh. I mean, we were there pretty much every day from, what was it, noon to six was like our shift. So it was about 30 hours a week for a full year. Wait, yeah. Did you get paid for that? We did not. No. We, that's, paid, that's, we, we paid. We paid the worst. <laughs> we paid about $10,000 of Yeah, dude. That. That's the worst. I had to do a, an internship uh, for my exercise science degree. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's 100 hours, but uh, you have to go and tell whoever you're in- interning with like signs off. And so I did it like an idiot at my own uh, weight center at, at NIU. And so all the crap I'd given my strength coaches like for four years, they just took oh, it out right. on me and they made me work for 400 hours instead yeah, of 100. Dude. I mean, I did the yeah. same shit, you know, when I did my, uh, um, my internship at San Jose state, I mean, dude, I was there pretty much working full time from 5 a.m. for the football workouts in the morning to sometimes I wouldn't leave until 5, 6 p.m. So it's yes, 12 yes. hour days five days a week. I mean, I was working 60 to 70 hours a week for free, you know? Yeah. And I was, I was paying for the summer class too. It's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're paying for that essentially. I think bottom line, we got to get us some interns. That's right. That's the key. That's the takeaway here. Yeah. Anyone out there just willing to pumping in interns and free, free labor. If you don't want to do something and you don't want to pay for it, just get an intern. Yeah. So, uh, it, for some listeners, man, that sounds like a lot of, studying for like cracking backs Mm -hmm. and so i think a a big reason that that people are skeptical about chiropractic specifically is because they think that's just what you guys do it's just you know here's a little adjustment oh it popped that's good uh now come back and pay me next week but why did you why is there so much studying uh for this so basically the um the, the easy answer to that is in most states in Illinois where we practice, you are considered a primary care physician. And what that means is you don't need a uh, physician referral. You can basically walk straight into the office with anything, uh, you know, cancer, tumors, herniated discs, whatever it happens to be, you can have it. And we're trained in the skills necessary to kind of like make that diagnosis or at least refer you in the right direction. So because of that wide scope, we'd have to be trained in a lot of different things. Now, now, uh, historically chiropractors are more like back and neck pain, headaches, things like that. Um, but theoretically our scope is very, very wide and anything could walk into the office and we have to be able to kind of triage that. We're, we're responsible, we're liable for, you know, yeah, again, like Kev said, like a lot of someone comes in, a lot of what we see is back pain, shoulder pain, stuff like that. But if somebody comes in with cancer or, diabetes, undiagnosed, anything like that, we are responsible to do a thorough examination and understand what's going on with them. So we can't just say, oh, well, I didn't know they had diabetes. It's like, well, there's clinical signs with some of these diseases and stuff like that. And it's our responsibility to know that and to treat them. And if you don't know they have diabetes, you know, there's going to be signs that you have to understand and recognize and potentially, you know, diagnose or a lot of times maybe even like refer them to somebody who specializes in that, right? Like, yeah. you know, depending on what the condition is, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm the expert in everything. And so if I see if somebody comes in and there's something that somebody else, you know, a MD is going to be better off treating them with, I'll refer them to that MD. Like, you know, there's no pride here. It's just making you sure. Guys don't, you guys there. don't uh, to crack the diabetes out of folks? <laughs> Only sometimes. Okay. If we, if we could do that, we would be so loaded. It's not even funny. Yeah. Well, um, but, that that brings me to um to like mixed and pure chiropractic. I learned yeah. this from you guys, where there's there's this kind of idea. Um, and I don't want to like put anyone down or anything like that. So I, I hope I, I'm not doing that. But I think from from what I, you guys correct this. So what I understand of pure chiropractic, it's to me it seems like chiropractic is the solution to everything. Your spine is the source of like all your life and yeah. uh, your, your, you know, your um, neural like pathways and everything. And so if you can get that right, then the rest of the body will heal itself. 
Sure. Whereas yeah. like the mixed approach to me seems like, well, yeah, there's that's important, but there's a whole bunch of other crap that we got to do too. For sure. Uh, I mean, and that's, and that's like kind of what I was about to touch on is like, there is a little bit of a divide in the chiropractic community, I guess, um, that it's a large I think divide. is one of the things that, that kind of has affected how chiropractors are respected in comparison to MDs. And it's because, you know, it's, it's, you were calling it pure, but it's in the term is straight chiropractic, um, is kind of more. That doesn't seem fair. They're, they're the straight when you guys are like the crooked. Yeah, well, I don't know, I don't know who termed like it, but jagged ones. <laughs> essentially that's more of like the philosophy that like you talked on, like, you know, there's this thing called the subluxation in your spine, right. And bone out of place, whatever people want to call that, that is basically the source of disease in your life. Right. And, um, you know, it sounds a little hocus pocusy. And I think a lot of modern, uh, research and, um, science is, starting to move away from that model. And there's a whole subsect of chiropractors that are kind of like digging their feet in and saying like, this is chiropractic. This is how chiropractic was created and what it was meant to be. And then there's a lot of other chiropractors that are starting to move towards, you know, the more evidence-based model and saying like, okay, like there's definitely something to the chiropractic adjustment and how it can help people. Right. But there it's not an end all be all. It's not like your spine is in line and now you're going to live a happy life. Right. Like it's like there's, there's things that uh, that need to be fixed without an adjustment. And there's things that adjustments can and can't fix. And just following an evidence based model. And um, that's kind of the camp that we more subscribe to. Right. I'm I'm not a very big um you know, believer in things that like, if it, if it can't be tangible, right. If there's nothing to back something up, right. Other than anecdotal evidence, which is not very high on the pyramid of, you know, the hierarchy of evidence. And like, you know, that's not going to be something that I truly think is a good treatment or, you know, model to follow. Whereas, you know, things that have high level research behind them, you know, not just randomized controlled trials, but, you know, meta analyses and stuff like that, that's the highest quality research. And so when you have, you know, modalities that are have tons of high quality research behind them, then that's something that we like to implement. And, you know, that's going to be the direction that we like to move in. Um, and, and I'm not saying that the chiropractic adjustment doesn't have any of that behind it because there's actually tons of studies that show the effectiveness of chiropractic treatment for patients with conditions, right? And so it's just following the research and not just saying, well, you know, I did it on Mrs. Jones and she felt better. And so mm -hmm. clearly this works, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. there's always gonna be variability in how people respond to treatments. And so you can't just let something like think like, oh, this is how I do it. You know, you gotta follow kind of where science and research, you know, takes sure. the care. And one thing to add to that too is if you, in defense of the adjustment or chiropractic, like Rai said, there are tons of meta-analyses and systematic reviews showing um, if you add spinal manipulation, which is kind of the, the, the science-y term for adjustment, um, if you add spinal manipulation to a therapy program that includes maybe some stability work, maybe some resistance training, maybe some things like that, that you can have an added benefit. And even some of the medical journals like JAMA is now are now kind of like recommending chiropractic care, including the adjustment, be a part of treatment plans. But they're not saying, hey, you have subluxation, your, your bones are out of alignment, and chiropractors are the only one that can fix it. It's more, uh, you know, it's a treatment modality that works for a good subset of people. But when you only test people with back pain, there's 90 billion different reasons someone could be in back pain. And so it's our job to kind of, you know, divide those up and adjust the people that need that and give stability work to the people that need stability and, you know, basically yeah. match the condition with the treatment and make yeah. sure that it's a yeah. cohesive. And, and, and for the record, the whole concept of the subluxation, it has pretty much been debunked by modern uh, research as, mm -hmm. you know, as we get more and more research on, you know, manipulation and stuff like that. The whole idea that you have a bone out of place or, you know, your joints aren't aligned and we're kind of putting them back in place, that's completely false. And mm -hmm. what's actually happening, happening is we're mobilizing a certain joint segment, right? So in your back, you know, two vertebrae near each other, 
they, you actually have the set joints that kind of um, link each vertebra together on the back of them, right? And so what's happening when we adjust you is we're essentially just mobilizing that that joint or right or the um you like know, the the segment. segment. <laughs> exactly. We're mobilizing that segment and you're just basically lightly, and when I say lightly, like millimeters gapping those joints. Okay. And all that's happening there is even that that crack you hear, we're not cracking bones. It's essentially gas being released from the joint capsule. Is it nitrogen? <laughs> Mm, I I can't say what type of gas is honestly. It's 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 irrelevant, really. Yeah. It's like it's it's just the fact that you're gapping that joint is allowing for that gas to be released, and that's what makes that little pop sound. And so it's a synovial fluid bubble, basically. Yeah. Okay. Within that joint. I, yeah, so, surrounding those those facet joints is a little joint capsule. You know, and that's that's what we're referring to. Yeah. And, and so I, you know, when we're adjusting people, that's really what's going on. We're not putting bones back in place. We're not realigning you or anything like that right it's like if you could just push on a bone and put it back in place that would lead to so many more injuries than you could fix yeah i mean like the fact that bones could just move around like that like you bones can move around like that but we call that a dislocation yeah. you know like that's not a good thing well you you bump into someone pain. on your way out of uh the chiropractor and now they're out of joint again yeah, yeah. exactly right. yeah um it, it, so it, go ahead. so is is I crack my knuckles and my mom's always like, you're going to get arthritis from that. Right. And it's like, well, I, then I like it. I want arthritis and cause I like <laughs> cracking my knuckles. And then I had a, uh, a chiropractor tell me once like, no, you know, it's releasing, I don't know if he said nitrogen or whatever, but he's like, yeah, it increases blood flow. That's what we do. Is that still like, what is the purpose of cracking? Yeah. I, I, I know you just said uh, you're, you're moving these segments and stuff, but why is that a good thing to do to someone's body? So I, the easiest way to explain this, and we'll, we'll use the spine, okay, we'll, we'll leave the hands out of it for right now. Uh, we'll use the spine as an example. So <clears throat> it's a pretty well-studied phenomenon when, you know what a spinal fusion is? Yeah, you it's cram a, these two bones together. and Yeah, basically if people have really bad degenerative disc disease or have disc issues, facet issues, whatever it happens to be, basically you combine two segments into one, and it's a, it's a surgical procedure. It's a fusion. Real, real quick, um, how does that work? Because when I think of fusion, it's like melting or something. Like how, how are they fusing those? They're basically taking two segments with the disc in between and placing screws and rods to connect those two. So the disc between them is no longer basically a mobile joint. They're taking two joints and making yeah. it. But they're not taking out the degenerated disc or anything. There yeah, are, they are. There are procedures where they can do disc replacements or they can take the disc out or they can fuse them together. If they, if they fuse, they're taking that disc in between them out though? Typically, yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, is it, it, is it, it just bone on, on the bone? It's just bone on bone at that point? They can do a disc replacement also. It kind of depends where the, at the level of uh, degeneration yeah. they are. To answer, to answer your question, yeah, it is bone on bone, but it's, it's one segment now. It's not like the bones are rubbing on each other. It's not yeah. like arthritis. It's just one segment now. So they take two vertebral segments and basically turn it into one segment, right? Okay. So again, going back to what I was saying though, yeah. so you have two uh, joints acting as one now, it's called adjacent segment disease. Basically the segment above and below of that fusion is very, very prone to arthritic change and basically taking on the stresses of those other two joints that are now one. So when you adjust somebody, let's say, you know, the research says we can be, we can be accurate up to about three segments in the spine. Okay. So if I palpate a stiff area, I can be like, okay, I'm, I'm pretty confident between, you know, one to three segments that I'm, I'm there. What I'm trying to do is equalize motion between say it's T1, T2, and T3 and not create a functional fusion of like T1 and T2, because we know that the, the um, segments above and below are going to be more prone to taking on more stress if T1, T2 doesn't move. So we're trying to equalize motion across the spine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, cause, cause then you, uh, it's like a domino effect, right? Where like you, you, you fuse that. And then if you're the next two are getting fused and then, yeah. and then all of a yeah, sudden it's a, it's a slippery slope. Rods and yep. Absolutely. Exactly. I mean, and the research even shows that with, with, um, you know, spinal fusion, you know, people may get relief from that for, you know, up to a couple of years after the procedure, but outcomes, you know, five, 10 years down the line from that procedure <clears throat> are actually tend to be no different than just conservative care in that case. And so it's like, depending how bad they are. Now, it is. Are, there are a lot I'm of speaking people. in generalities because obviously every, yeah. everybody's case is different, mm -hmm. but like, you know, overall, um, and even, even the medical community is moving away from recommending spinal fusion surgery unless, you know, kind of all else has failed. Basically so, large neurological deficits. So drop foot, someone can't use their foot, 
real, yeah. real large disc herniations. At that point, you're like, okay, I can't use my foot and I'm risking further injury. The fusion is, uh, you know, that's kind of what they do. But yeah, you're trying to avoid that at all costs. And so, so that's something that you guys can offer people uh, instead of just, you know, go right underneath the knife, mm-hmm. do the, do this long care, uh, long-term option. And you're saying that on, on that long-term option of, of going the chiropractic route, um, it could have this, the same results or, or better results. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, yeah, now, again, not in every case, but there's many, right. many people that are getting ready for surgery and they come to us and we're able to get them better and stronger and yeah. Right. I've heard that with like uh, like the the famous bodybuilder Ronnie Ronnie Coleman, where he he was like they were, they told him to go into the knife like a bunch, and he's like, "Well, I'm a bodybuilder. Like this is literally how I make money. I can't just have yeah. these scar scar tissue and stuff." Sure. And he and the chiropractor saved him like years and years. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then like now he's just completely wrecked though, uh, and he's yeah. got all sorts of fusions. More, more you, can't from make, the, you can't make off of the extremes. You know, right. he's in the right. in case. Uh, well, but they even they even saved him like years, like oh, of, yeah, of competing because he went the chiropractic route instead of going under the knife right away. In and almost all cases, in almost all cases, surgery should be a last resort, right? I mean, again, athletes. You, it, I think it's become so commonplace because everyone watches sports and they oh, someone tears their ACL, they get surgery the next day. Someone tears their meniscus, they get surgery the next day. Someone right. tears their road. So it's like, but these guys are athletes who. They can't they can't perform if they're walking around with a torn rotator cuff or a, or a partially torn meniscus, right? Like they need to be a hundred percent, and so they go under the as knife because, possible, right? exactly because they need to be as in, in perfect shape, right? Whereas like a, a normal person, general person could tear their meniscus, and realistically, they don't need surgery. You can walk around on a torn meniscus with very little pain or at least be able to manage that very well and still live a pretty active life and stuff. But it's like people think of surgery as like a quick fix because all the athletes get it and it makes it and look at they're all playing football again two weeks later. But it's like, that's not real life for most people. And so even, even a torn ACL, there's tons of people, you know, even in my time working, you know, in physical therapy and, and strength conditioning is that people can tear an ACL and like, you don't need surgery because you don't need an intact ACL to live a, a somewhat normal life right so it's like obviously if people want to remain extremely extremely active then maybe surgery is an option so that they can you know if they can still go run an iron man or something if they're a weekend warrior or whatever but like a general person who's like yeah i just want to live a normal life you don't need surgery for your torn acl you can rehab and live a completely normal life with a torn acl the rest of your life the other thing to mention too is that with it you know with the torn meniscus and torn rotator cuff case that we're talking about before is like I think it's important for the public. So if the public sees this, this is important for them to know. Like if you were to MRI a hundred people randomly off the street, say they're asymptomatic, they have no pain. The rates of labral tears in the shoulder, meniscus tears in the knee, herniated discs in the spine, all those injuries, the rates of asymptomatic positives on imaging are super, super high, almost to the point where the imaging means almost nothing sometimes. Um, Obviously in cases of trauma and fracture, dislocation, imaging, you know, you need it. But like in the case of like low back pain, that's why the that's why the guidelines say, you know, within, without red flag symptoms, give it six, you know, maybe eight weeks to recover. Because even if we see a herniated disc, that doesn't mean they need surgery and injections right away. They can go the conservative route and, you know, be fine. Because so many people are living with that uh, that problem and not experiencing pain. Exactly. In the exactly. The imaging is not correlated to people's real life experience very well at all and and that's not just us as chiropractors saying that that's the entire rehab and medical community agrees on this three in here being active as active as we are we probably have some torn labrum some torn meniscus and some herniated disc and we're not feeling anything right now so just because Uh, we see that some of us are are. (laughs) speaking in generalities I'm I'm hurting all the time, dudes, and uh, I know you guys need to come turn uh, turn my lights on, (laughs) my power on. Um, So here's here's just a random. I want to get back to all this, um, but a random thought that I have is so okay. So I'm a Christian, and um, and I I talk about design in the world. Um, You can talk about there's people who talk about design, you know, like the blind watchmaker or you know evolution. Either way, both of us, all of us, talk about our bodies being made for purposes that, that we enact every day. Mm-hmm. So 
what what's so weird to me is like we think that sitting is normal. We think that like sitting in cars is normal. I'm sitting at a desk right now on this wooden chair, and I assume that's normal. But like, why do we think that sitting at this level is right? You know, so like I, I don't I don't even know. Like, what are we made for? Are we made to walk around? Because there's like all sorts of you can go the evolutionary route and be like, well, we're hunter gatherers, and so we should be running all the time. But it's like you know we have jobs. We have to sit down and stuff. What do you guys think about like ergonomic chairs and like are there studies on on like the right posture for sitting? How how would someone go about you know there's standing desks now there's it's just yeah. bonkers to me that like this desk is this height but that's just because someone made it this height no one did yeah. a study on what's the right height right. for a human specific to you yeah I'll mm -hmm. I'll say something real quick here and you can go right um, in terms of like posture posture is a is a crazy topic but like. In, in my opinion, and kind of from what I've read, um, posture is is important to a degree, but there isn't one specific posture that everyone needs to adopt. Not everyone needs to be walking around perfectly chin retracted, really and living their life like that. It's impossible to think. It's impossible to expect from someone, and really, it's about one time spent in those positions and loads like the load applied in those positions so like there's nothing wrong with sitting there's nothing wrong with standing but if you do one way more than the other the people that stand all day at work have the opposite back issues as the people that sit all day at work you know what i mean yeah, yeah. prolonged exposure to certain positions hmm. and there's nothing wrong with those positions but you should be moving and i think evolutionarily speaking if you want to go down that route that you know, we were designed to move and we were not designed to really sit in chairs and load our spines and our, our joints this way yeah. over time for hours and hours and hours every day. And so I think that's why you see some of the things that, you know, we see in clinic all the time so frequently. But yeah, there's not like one specific perfect posture that everyone needs to like, you know, try to maintain all day. I think that's unrealistic. But definitely, there's definitely postural considerations that if someone's in pain already, you can say, all right, well, look at your 12 hour day nine and a half of those hours are spent looking like a, like a turtle in their shell. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, let's, let's do something to change that a little bit or strengthen yeah. your body to withstand those postures. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, Kev kind of hit it right in the head is like, again, if you, you want to go like what, what, what our bodies were made to do, our bodies were made to move. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's essentially the best posture for you is to just keep moving. Right. So, and not to say like, oh, be the most active person. Ever. It's like, it's the classic, you know, the poisons in the dose, right? Hmm. Too much sitting is bad for you. Too much standing, bad for you. Too much squatting probably would be bad for you. Too much anything. Is Dean, though. What's that? <laughs> Don't tell that to one Dean. <laughs> if, if our old uh, football yeah. coach is listening. I really hope he doesn't, he doesn't watch this. <laughs> he was obsessed um, with squats. Every, every, uh. <laughs> At the antidote to anything was to squat. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's like it's like too much of anything is bad for you. And you just constantly want to like have variation in in your life, right? And it mm. seems so intuitive, but that's really what it is, is is you see, you know, all these even like pro, pro athletes, you know, you're like, well, then pro athletes are super active. Why do why do they get injured so much? Why do their bodies get so beat up? You know, it's like look at all these football players whose knees are shot at the end of their right. careers and stuff. And it's like Okay, but they're they're one end of the spectrum, right? They're they're again the poisons in the dose, right? And so they're getting paid millions of dollars, or you know, however much they're getting paid for their respective sport to do that. And at a certain point, performance is not correlated to health, right? And so it's like, you know, if you want to squat eight hundred pounds, that's awesome, that's really really cool, and not a lot of people on earth can do that. But at a certain point that's not beneficial to your health. And in fact, it's, it's detrimental to your health. Squatting 800 pounds is not good for your health. Yeah. Now, the, the diminishing returns, right? Exactly. Like, exactly. That, so the, that's so hard, dude. Like, cause you get good at something and you want to keep doing it. That's and, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. the, it's the, it's the, you know, it's such a, it's such a classic dilemma of like, how much is the right amount? Right. You know, how much should I do this? But is, is this too little? Is it too much? I mean, that's what makes, you know, drawing from my strength conditioning background, strength and conditioning, so such a cool field to me is because, and we're just scratching the surface because of how uh, into training and how popular it's becoming, but it's it's really becomes more of an art than a science because every single athlete you work with, every person you work with, whether you're a personal trainer or a strength conditioning coach, like everyone has a different threshold. 
and everyone has a different sport. Everyone has a different goal. And so you have to determine that. And when you're creating somebody's program, there is no one size fits all. And so you, you know, you you become like a painter and you take your little dab on your, your, that little circle thing with all the colors on it. And you, you put a little bit there and yeah, your palette <laughs> and you put a little bit there and then uh, you take a little one, you put, and, and you're, you're never going to paint the same picture twice because every single person you work with is different, right? You're never working with clones. And so it's like finding the right amount of everything, the right amount of front squat, the right amount of, you know, RDL, the right amount of overhead press, everything that you're putting in somebody's program, it's going to be different for everybody. And so there is no right answer, right? That, that, that golden, that holy grail of how much is the right amount? What should I, what, what's that one rule that you should tell all your patients? How much should they squat? How, what's the one rule? It doesn't exist. It really doesn't. And so you have to like, once people can kind of realize that and it's like, you know, even it took me a while to even realize that as I've developed and matured as a strength coach and even a athlete or trainer myself is like, you know, I go through phases of doing this so much. Like I was, you know, Olympic lifting a ton all to the point where I probably was overtraining and I herniated a disc in my back and, you know, I was stubborn and saying like, you know, I got to train through this. And, but at a certain point it was like, all right, I was probably doing too much. And I had surpassed that, that middle ground of like, what's the right amount to optimize my training or yeah. Yeah. performance. And so did you have um, to adjust yourself out of that? You just Yeah, it was, it was kind of a weird rig. That's no, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that was the thing. It was like, I, I was looking for the fix. Right. And yeah. I realized like, I just have to apply everything I know. And kind of take a step back and say, like, okay, you know, it's it's so hard to treat yourself as a patient, but I think it was a good tool for me because I had to take a step back and treat myself as a patient and not say, you know, I I couldn't tell myself what to do. I just had to say, okay, what would I tell somebody else to do? And even if I feel like it's not working or something, like I just gotta trust it because that's what I expect my patients, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you have those patients that you tell them to do this exercise to help their back, or you're having them do stuff in office and they come in the next week and they're like, Yeah, it's not really different. And you gotta be like, be patient. Like we just got to stick with this or, you know, give it some time. So I had to do that to myself. I had to trust myself and be like, okay, just follow the concepts. You know, the principles, right? You're, you know, this stuff because you, you do it every day. And once I did that and I kind of let go, I was able to, my back was better. I had a, I had a herniated disc in my back and six months later after kind of trusting the process and it was frustrating, but after trusting the process, I was hitting squat PRs. So it was like one, the first time I hit that PR after I had hurt my back and came back from that. It was like so validating because it was like, yeah, dude, these concepts work and there is no one size fits all, but just apply the concepts and you'll find that fit. You know what I mean? You just oh, got to find it. on your disc right now. Uh, I haven't had, so I had an MRI that confirmed the disc herniation, which again, I know we just talked about imaging not always being correlated, but at a certain point that the imaging is a tool, right? And if it's matching the symptoms, you could say like, okay, we could think that, you know, anatomically what we're seeing on the MRI is matching clinically your symptoms, that's probably the culprit. But so I had an MRI, had a herniated disc and, um, you know, just rehab myself. And I just got to the point where I didn't, I never went back for another MRI because again, I know that the imaging doesn't matter, but I was able to get to the point where I can squat heavy pain free. And it was like, that was the biggest thing is I was squatting and my numbers were all going down. I like couldn't hit, I even getting into positions, like it was all off and I just knew something was wrong. And that's why I ended up getting like, you know, getting some imaging done to see like, okay, what is actually going on? Am I crazy? And so, um, you know, is it, is it possible that it's still herniated? What's up? Is it possible that it's still herniated right now? It's a hundred percent possible. That it's still herniated. hundred <laughs> percent possible. You're not experiencing pain. No, no. And that, and that's what we, and that's what we tell our patients is like, whatever you come in, you show us, you hold up your MRI, your x-ray and you say, Hey, this is, you know, they told me I have a herniated disc, uh, at L5. And I'm like, okay, cool. Thanks for bringing that. And I'll take a look at that, you know, just to see what's going on. But like, I don't really care. Like we're like, that's, this isn't going to change. I don't say, I don't really, I don't say I don't care. But like in my head, I'm like, yeah, okay. Because, but that's the thing is like, we're, we're going to let our treatment be dictated by how you respond to the treatment. So I don't care if you get better. And in three weeks you walk in my office and you say, Hey, I'm pain free. And then we popped you in an MRI machine and your disc was still herniated. I'd be like, okay, well, we're going to keep doing what we're doing because, and to the patient, all that matters is their symptoms, right? Who cares if you have a herniated disc in your back, if, if you feel fine and you can do everything you want to do, right? And you can pick up your grandchildren. Right. So like, is, is there like a long-term, is there like long-term damage happening because it's herniated? 
So, so that's the, that's the, that's the age old question. Nobody can really prove that there is da- like excessive damage happening to these discs or let, for a disc, for a disc issue, for example, nobody can really say like, Hey, when the disc protrudes this much, when you're 22, you're going to have issues when you're 45, that correlation can't be made yet. Mm -hmm. Um, in my opinion, if you've had years and years and years of just, you herniate disc, herniate disc, herniate disc over time, more than likely you're going to get some narrowing at some point of that disc space. And you might have some issues later, but again, that correlation is, is a little tough to make in like research populations. And I was going to say this while Rye was talking too. really just an, an injury is just tissue tolerance and like load going into that tissue. So how much can the tissue tolerate and what loads are you putting into that tissue? And when there's a mismatch there, you have an injury. So it's like, yes, the disc is herniated, but plenty of people are fine with disc herniations. There's no great correlation to say, yeah, when you're 50, this is going to be an issue. There's plenty of people living totally pain-free lives that had disc herniations, you know, back in the day. Once that thing's healed, you, you know, you're, you're that's starting. What's, that's so interesting. Cause like, you know, everyone thinks herniated disc, dude, I got to go get that operated on now. It's out of place. It's out of whack or whatever. Is there, um, can one of you guys just explain herniated disc and maybe like, what, what is a slip disc? Is that the same yeah. thing? Or is that just like the common word for that? Like what? There, there are, there are gradations to a herniation. So the disc is basically the, Everyone says like the jelly filled donut. I hate that uh, explanation, but it kind of is true. It's kind of like the, like the little shock absorber in between your vertebrae and cartilage, right? What's that? Is it cartilage? It's two different types of tissue. Yeah. It's the annulus fibrosis and the nucleus pulposus. We could go down that route if you want to. Essentially you could think about it. Like holding it together. Is that like fibrous? Is that what? Yeah. The annulus is the, like the annular circles on the outside kind of holding it together. The nucleus pulposus is the kind of the center point of it. So basically when you stress that disc too much in one direction or even just overall stress it, it will tend to kind of leak out, you know, between the vertebrae, the vertebral end plates. And typically it's going to go posterior lateral. So back in, you know, to the, to the sides like this. And typically, you know, when we get those radiating symptoms down the leg, numbness, tingling, things like that, all that means is that disc has now protruded on the spinal nerve that's exiting the the uh, um, the IVF, the intervertebral foramen. And pushing on that nerve, that's giving you the shooting pain or the tingling, and yeah. typically, typically okay. now now a disc that has been protruding for a long time, that nerve can kind of sensitize to that pressure, meaning you can have a herniation without those symptoms. But if you clinically correlate, like in Rye's case, you've got, you know, disc pushing on nerve, you've got L5 radiculopathy symptoms, you know, you can be pretty, you know, convinced that that's what they got going on. Um, but yeah, so there's gradations to it. You can have a disc bulge, you can have a disc protrusion, extrusion, sequestration. Those are kind of like the main, uh, like, that's kind of like the continuum of, of herniations. And all that is, is going from slightly protruding to more protruding to even more protruding to broken off and into the uh, kind of central canal. That's, that's a little nasty. Well, well, bulging sounds bad. Bulging sounds, but you're saying that's not as bad. Bulging is like the, the best of those. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. Bul- I have a bulging <laughs> disc. You're like, oh yeah, you're fine. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Sequestration like, is the worst bulging one. Bulging discs. It's like. Sequestration yeah. sounds like no, like sounds like no big deal. Like, oh, like yeah, sequester. But it's Sequ- like, that. that's a bad one. Sequestration technically means that disc got almost like cleaved off and you're probably not having those radiating symptoms anymore. So you had them big time and it's been kind of cleaved off now. All right. So that that's actually a tough clinical case is like, okay, you have yeah. real severe symptoms. All right. Um, a lot of radiculopathy, a lot of nerve symptoms. And then, you know, all of a sudden they kind of go away immediately. You got to think, okay, there's potentially a sequestration going on. That's a, that's a, you know, indication for imaging to kind of see what's going on with that. Cause the disc material is pretty inflammatory if it gets out into the open and that's yeah. kind of what uh, causes a lot of that pain. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So the, re- the reason a sequestration could be bad is because if a big chunk of that disc that comes off is now floating in your spinal canal, right. That can disrupt your spinal cord. And then you can have some major issues. So um, you, you, know, it, you may have symptoms that go away once that disc starts pushing on that nerve root. But if that remnant of disc, you know, is dislodged and ends up pushing up on your spinal cord, you could have even more severe symptoms. So that's one that's like, if it gets to that point, that was probably a herniated disc that went unchecked for so long and like nothing, they didn't change anything about what they were doing. And so it just made it worse and worse and worse until something like that happened. Okay. Or just a completely traumatic 
accident or something like that. So when, when we talk about these cases, the first thing you're thinking, and I bet you're thinking this, Parker, is like, I feel like everyone should just get an MRI just to like be sure. I was just thinking that, dude. <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. And I went through chiropractic school thinking, I feel like it's not a bad idea just to kind of get an image of everything, see where right. I'm at, and right. then I'll know. Um, and I, personally, just because I'm interested in anatomy and radiography and stuff, I think it would be cool to see like most of your joints in your spine and your, your knees and stuff, just kind of see. Um, but again, the correlation, if you go to research, is, is pretty poor to pain. It's pretty poor to function. Um, and it's really not worth it. Honestly, it, it, it can create negative um, – Kind of like a negative mental association association with your pain. So if you talk about things like fibromyalgia, chronic pain syndrome, things like that, you can people that have had like serial imaging done, and the doctor says, "Oh my God, you have the spine of an eighty year old. Your knees are they, uh, they look you got one year left before you get a um, you know replacement." Those people are going to go home and be like, "Oh, dude, well I'm not squatting, I'm not running, I'm not biking, I'm not doing anything because my knees are terrible." Uh, like they start to become their MRI, right? Like it's like negative. they may not have even had very bad symptoms before, but now they start yeah. to like it's self just self manifest because now they're telling themselves they have this. And now, like, you know, the brain is a powerful thing. And if your brain thinks you're in pain, then you're in pain. You know what I mean? Right. And the episodic nature of pain means that maybe they were just at the top of that episode. And in two to three weeks, had they not talked themselves into being pain, they would have been in a, in a lull period. But now their nervous system is heightened right. up and they're staying in pain. Yeah. And that's, and that's not to say that, like, people come to our office, like, they want to be in pain. or that, But it's just, like, mm -hmm. it's it becomes, they become very sensitized to their pain. But if you're constantly, the way our nervous system works, right? If we know about how like neuroplasticity works in, in, in any way, you know, the more that something happens in your nervous system, it creates a feedback loop where it's like self-feeding, right? And that's mm -hmm. that's a good thing, right? Because that's how we develop motor patterns and all these, these things that our nervous system allows us to do is because it's able to like learn and do things and adapt to what it needs to be doing. But on the flip side, it also can lead to, um, you know, central sensitization and, and chronic pain, even when the initial pain generator is no longer there, right? And that's what we see with people with chronic pain. Those are some of the toughest patients to um, fix, not because we can't fix them, but because th this feedback loop of pain has been going on so long for them that it's it's nearly impossible to break that cycle. And, um, you know, that's what the, what? It's possible. Yeah. Well, yeah, as I said, nearly not not impossible, but like yeah. it's just to get them out of that rut is such yeah. a battle because they've just been feeling it for so long that their body is just like expects the pain, and and these channels have been built like these pain pathways. We have specific nerves that that relay pain up to the brain that makes you conscious of the pain that you're feeling, and so when those have been like reinforced, reinforced, reinforced because they've been used so much that now their threshold for being stimulated is now so much lower that things that wouldn't normally stimulate pain are signaling these pathways to fire and they're feeling pain, right? And it's not, they're not crazy. The pain's not in their head, but in a way it is because all pain is relative. Everybody's pain is real to them. And so, um, you know, breaking that cycle is very difficult for some people. That's so <laughs> interesting because um, I, I think about neural pathways uh, in thought. And so the, like what you think about, you develop these neural ruts and it's easier to go think that way. And we talk about that uh, as Christians, we talk about that in like fighting pornography addiction, where it's like, dude, it's it's real easy to go in there if you keep watching porn, uh, especially like in, in dudes. And so it's like, you got to fight that and you got to fight to build different neural ruts. And it's so weird to think that like even the pain is, yeah. is making neural ruts so and that it's, and it's anything you're feeling, it feels like pain. It's the same principle at work is, again, that neuroplasticity, that that buildup of neural pathways, that the more you reinforce them and the more that you use them, the more the stronger they get and the more your body almost like favors them because it's like the, you know, the easiest flow of things, yeah. ways for things to happen, you know? There's a, there's a thing from, I think it was a neurologist or a neuroscientist that said like neurons that fire together, wire together. So physically, like the dendrite of the neuron. Mm -hmm. When, they're, when that pathway has just fired over and over and over and over, so pain, 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 they will literally like begin to, what, what neuroplasticity is, is like kind of like a regrowth of these neuron, like the dendrite area of the neuron, and they will kind of wire together so that that pain pathway is even more efficient now because your body wants mm -hmm. to be efficient. And so that's that's kind of the, the thought behind some of the fibromyalgia and chronic pain syndrome. And I think what the cool thing about, well, not cool, but the, the crazy thing about those conditions is 
say you go to image their shoulder that they've had pain in for 25 years. Um, they may have a totally intact, totally intact rotator cuff. Labrum's fine. Uh, no muscle tears, no fractures, no dislocations, totally clean MRI, but they have eight out of 10 unrelenting pain in their shoulder. It's like, what did the imaging tell us there? All the structures are fine. So there's another cause of pain somewhere along there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and pain all. science, I mean, you're right, Park, like pain science is, it's a growing field that's getting more and more research behind it. And it's super interesting because it, it, it branches off of like, you know, what we know about our brains, right? Our nervous systems are an extension of our brains and um, pain science is just one branch of that. And it, to truly understand how pain works, we still don't fully know everything about it yet. And yeah. so every day there's more research coming out about pain science and rehab and all of this stuff. And it's super interesting because our brains you know, the more we learn about the nervous system, the, the less we actually know, because it's like, you just keep opening more and more doors of like this amazing complex <laughs> aspect of being a human being and what makes us human. And our brains are so, all, almost all of that. You know what I mean? It's crazy. My, my, uh, my uncle is a, uh, I don't know if he's still doing this, but he was a, a pain researcher. He was a, a scientist of pain, doctor of pain, which is hilarious. Like pain yeah. doctor. Yeah. But and they doctor, yeah. they would they would like harvest um, uh, rattlesnake venom, and they were using that in their in their studies on people and stuff. And one of the rattlesnakes got loose into the vents and stuff. And so, like, I couldn't. I was visiting him in Salt Lake City once, and I couldn't go into his office because there was rattlesnake in the vents, which is hilarious. <laughs> you, you can know about pain, like just just get bit by that rattlesnake. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to pivot. Kev, do you still have a little bit more time to go here? Or you gotta. Yeah, run? I'm good. Okay. okay. I wanted to talk about like the, uh, I don't know if this is even right, dude, pulling back from my, my undergrad days, but like the neuromuscular aspect of pain and, uh, chiropractic sure. uh, is that, is like neuromuscular uh, a good word to use there? Yeah. The kind of like the neural mm -hmm. involvement of pain. Yeah. Well, I, I, and, yeah. and, and for like, and for posture and stuff. So like for me, dude, I wrestled until like all the way through college and my neck just wants my, I want to go forward right here. I just want to live here. And so all day I'm fighting to keep my chin back, mm -hmm. keep my stuff back. And it's not like a, I don't think it's, it's uh, anything to do with the bones. It's just, that's the way the muscles are and they're stiff and they're hard. And yeah. uh, so what, how much does that play into your treatment of folks? I, it, it would definitely play into the treatment. I think not, not to call you out, but look at all those books behind you. Like you're probably reading books for a long period of time. You're writing a lot. There's a, yeah. probably a lot of time spent in a forward head position. Yeah. So I, I would start to look at that too. It's wrestling too, but how long has it been since you wrestle? It's been. I still you know, wrestle though. So. All right. Well, I'm just saying like in terms of like your, your every day. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're doing a lot less wrestling now. So it, it maybe is playing a factor in that, but um, you know, look at, look at the, Look at the hours a day you're up and look at the positions you're in. That would be one thing. Yeah. Um, when you talk about like how chiropractic and kind of like the philosophy of what we do, how that would change that, like what, what would we do for that issue? Um, I think, I, I think an important concept is like the gate control theory. And basically what this is, is kind of an explanation for most manual therapies. And you can kind of explain adjustments in this way as well. Um, rise out of here. He didn't want to hear about that. <laughs> So, so basically, the gate control theory says that um, neurologically, say we have a say we have pain in our our leg, all right, and we have pain, you know, perception going up to the brain, okay, from the leg. Mm -hmm. If we massage, adjust, um, dry needle, do something that stimulates these nerve fibers at the same time as those nociceptive fibers going up to the brain, nociception would be pain fibers. If we can almost like interrupt that pain signal we can then have a reduction of pain. It doesn't last forever, but if we can interrupt that signal and then maybe train the muscle or train that area and kind of rehab it, that we're going to have better outcomes in terms of pain. Because if we just try to hammer away, say for your neck, we just try to hammer away at exercise over and over and over and over, and you're still having pain and, and more exercise is making it worse, you're kind of digging yourself a hole in terms of like your recovery process. So you, it, sometimes it's necessary to use an adjustment or dry needling or, or hands-on therapy to kind of just break that pain signal temporarily and then reinforce with some good postures and positions and rehab and stuff. So so on that point, um, I know back from my time in, in class with all this stuff, uh, 
they were, they were talking about different types of like pain fibers and stuff like that, or, or C fibers, whatever it was. Yeah. And, and like the reason that when you skin your knee or like you, you bonk your, uh, bonk is like the technical term. I think you bonk your shin. That's a medical. Yeah, yeah. That's what we and, use in our notes. Right. Right. And you guys paid a lot of money to, to say bonk, but you're, you're rubbing your leg because you're, tr you don't know this, but you're recruiting different fibers. That's and you're, yeah. What's that's, that called? That's, that's exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what Kev was just hitting on is, is your when you push on your knee, right? You you stub your toe or you jam your finger and you squeeze it because it hurts. That's essentially triggering different nerve relay fibers up to the yeah. brain. And those ones are going to move. They signal faster than pain yeah. fibers. And so it basically overrides them. It's just talking to your brain louder than the pain fibers that's, are. That's like recruitment, right? Isn't that called recruitment or something? Yeah. And so yeah. and so you're you're essentially telling your brain to ignore the pain, right? Because your brain is constantly getting stimuli from all sites of things, everything you see, everything you hear, everything you feel, everything you smell all times a day. And it has to be able to filter stuff out or, you know, you just can't make sense of the world because it's being overloaded with all this information, right? So your, your, our brains are really good at ignoring lots of what we're actually being stimulated by throughout the day. And so in the same regard, when you stub your toe and then you, you hold it or you skin your knee and you're pushing on it, right? It's, it's telling your brain, it's giving your brain certain information. And that information is able to override the pain information that's being told to it. And it, it kills the pain essentially. And, and, yeah. and, that, and that's what we talk about is like, when we say pain is relative is because our bodies have to perceive pain. Pain isn't something inherently that you feel, right? It has to be relayed to the brain and process to, to be cognizant of it. And yep. so when you can, when you can block that with other information, it distracts you from feeling that pain and that pain in that moment doesn't exist, you know? So perception is actually the, um, like the, it's basically the transmission of pain fibers, but nociception doesn't feel like anything until it gets to your brain. So nociception is just a signal going up, goes to the thalamus and then boom, then it's, then it's pain. Okay. So it's nothing until it gets up there. You know what I mean? Right, exactly. and it, and you and you guys, uh, it, it travels slower than than the other type of of uh, exactly. stimuli. Is that it right? Which fiber stimulated? It kind of gets in a little bit of a yeah. There's 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 and in fiber subsets of pain fibers, subsets of there's yeah. subsets of all these different types of fibers. But you know, without getting too deep into the weeds, yeah, the the pressure fibers or the touch fibers are our signals are sent up to the brain faster and um, you know more efficiently than the pain fibers, and so that's why they your brain pays attention to those more. Okay. So uh, some, something that Julie, uh, my wife, for people who don't know, is an athletic trainer. And uh, she was talking with a um, uh, ambulance. Uh, what are those? C uh, EMT. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they were saying that something that they've been doing now is like pain treatment early during the injury or whatever, because like your body reacts so poorly to, well, not not poorly, right? But like, your body jacks itself up uh, when you're in pain. And so I guess like something that they're trying to, they're, they're thinking about or they're enacting already is like pain management first uh, in order to like stop all the negative uh, effects that come from pain, like locking up and all these kind of yeah. things that your body does, which is so weird to think about where it's like, those are, those are useful for us, but if we could stop them, we might end up with less damage or I've always, I've always thought the same thing. It's like, the example of like rolling your ankle, it's like, Oh, the swelling is good because it's bringing kind of nutrients to heal, but it's also preventing us from moving, which we know is a good thing long-term. You know what I mean? You know, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like, which one do you do first? Um, so that's kind of interesting. I don't know what they would use for like immediate pain relief other than like, all right, let's stick an IV in them and get some more. Drug them up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it, and like the pharmaceutical has been backing it, which is so weird to think that they uh, would want to. Yeah. Why would, I don't know why they would want to <laughs> I'm just do kidding. That. They don't, they don't do that. <laughs> no, but yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know specifically what that is. So I'd be interested to learn more, but um, I, I yeah. think, it, I think it's a good concept, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and like, like we said, like pain science every day, there's more stuff coming out about it. So it's like, I wouldn't be surprised if another study came out. Like the fact that they're exploring that is totally feasible and, It'd be super interesting if they came out with something, you know, that new or groundbreaking in regards to that. I think what's crazy, the more you read about like pain science and stuff too, like we learned about this in our like a neuro, a neuro, neuro anatomy class is like, for example, say someone is in a ton of pain, but they're literally in the Super Bowl 
and this is like what their whole life's work has like built up to. They're super jacked up to be there. Like you might play through a very sprained ankle. You might play through a torn ligament because the rest of your system is like so jacked up. You know, your epinephrine, your nor all that stuff is just, you know, through the roof, your adrenaline's high. And like, I think that's crazy. So like you might in a normal situation, that sprained ankle might put you out of the game. You know, you're, you're laying down with ice on your leg, but given the right conditions, you're good to go. You that's know? insane. Kurt, yeah. Kurt Angle, uh, you know, the, for, for some who have heard that name, he's a famous WWE star, but before that he won Olympic gold medal with a broken neck. And just because he's just his body was lit, just turned no, up yeah. to 10. His well, whole life he prepared for this and it wasn't going to stop him. He probably didn't even know he had a broken neck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. What's uh, Tara Owens Tara played Owens. in the Super Bowl with a broken leg? He broke it like two weeks earlier and I was like, all right, he's out for the Super Bowl. And then he played in the Super Bowl, like, and he had like a great game. It's like, how the hell does somebody play pro NFL football with a broken leg? Yeah. Other than Greg Jennings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody got that reference. reference. Uh, So, so I wanted to finish up with like a holistic health kind of stuff. You guys, is it called mixed? Are you guys mixed chiropractors? I guess if you had to put us in like a category, I don't know. I'm not like, this is what we are, but sure. Yeah. Like, I guess we fall more to that side of the spectrum. Well, more and, there than the other side. Well, and ask, cause you guys, so I wanted to definitely uh, promote this. Like it, it's, you guys have a company, a business called Synoptics. Yeah, synaptics, uh, physical synaptics. medicine, and synaptics health performance. Yeah, and where's that? Where's that? Where's that at? So I'll kind of explain like the continuum idea. So basically, yeah. what we kind of our kind of philosophy, I guess, on health and performance. Not to say the same <laughs> words over and over, but the philosophy is basically you know from day one of an injury all the way up until you know game day or you know whatever your goal is. We basically want to have services that kind of can help you through that. And so, you know, essentially our treatment plans on the Cairo side end looking very similar to a training session on the training side. So it's kind of one continuum from like, all right, day one, you're in pain, you're hunched over, you can't even move, you're in 10 out of 10 pain. Our, our company, our philosophy is designed to basically bring you through the entire continuum of health all the way to, you know, game day or, you know, back to full lifting, back to playing with your kids, back to running, whatever you want to do. Um, and those two companies are kind of, you know, situated next to one another and we kind of pass people from one to the other. The truth is too, a lot of people come to us for training and have bumps and bruises that they want looked at. And so what better person to work on you than someone who's spent, you know, three, four hours a week with you training you, they know your movement compensations, they know your issues. If they're a chiropractor, you know, whatever, and they can treat that pain easily, then that's a really good, you know, fit for us. But that's kind of where our companies sort of line up. It's like, from day one of injury all the way to, you know, competition day, we have, you know, things that, you know, cater to you. Do you guys have, have nutrition incorporated in there too? Yeah, we do. We do nutrition counseling. Um, you know, it, it just depends on like essentially what everybody needs. Like we're not, we try not to like push, right? Like it's essentially like we give, like we give you what is going to be right for you based on your goals and stuff like that. And, you guys oh, never sneak in and you like, uh, like you got this out of shape dude and you're like, hey, some of your program is going to include you lifting at the end of this. Well, like it, it, it just depends too. Like with, with people, you have to like, you have to give them what they're going to adhere to. Right. And if someone's in a very detrained, deconditioned state, trying to push training on somebody in that state might not be what's like best for them. At least like mm-hmm. what's going to get them to adhere to it. Right. It's like yeah. they, you know, people come to you out of shape know that they're out of shape right they're not they're not blind they're not stupid right and so (laughs) i mean for the most part and so and so it's like you don't have to spell out for them how out of shape they are and so it's like getting them to a point where they feel like they like you don't know what's going on with people right and it's like maybe they're really out of shape because they went through some tough stuff tough or tough stuff like a family member died or something like that and so it's like you got to get them back to a place where they have the confidence to work out again and stuff like that. And yeah, those people who come to you as athletes, and you know, sometimes you we have to go from the other side of thing, and they just want to train, and we have to say like, hold on, like if you want to <laughs> truly be a good athlete, we need to address some stuff before we have you squatting five hundred pounds. Yeah, you know I mean, and so it's like that's that's kind of what the continuum is all about is having we we want to create this like new paradigm in terms of like healthcare and fitness and and performance, right? It's like it's not two different things, right? For so long, I felt like, and this is kind of what led us to create the company is 
it felt like strength and conditioning and, you know, physical medicine, physical therapy, rehab, whatever you want to call it, were kind of like these two different fields and they butted it heads on a lot of things, right? Strength yeah. coaches said this, physical therapists said this, right? And so like we were from a distance, you know, we, from being in both fields, right? I worked in physical therapy. I worked in strength conditioning. I could be like, these are, these are two of the same thing, right? It's like looking at the, the, the two way mirror, right? You're looking at the same thing from two different angles. And so we're like, let's, let's create a new, like a paradigm shift in terms of a model for getting people from one end of the spectrum to the other and wherever they need to get to in between. Right. And so that's why, like I was talking about with, you know, you come to us for rehab or something like that, you know, once you, once you are no longer injured, you know, our philosophy is, it doesn't, that doesn't mean you're done, right? Like let's, let's get you back to, let's get you past that point because the chances are you got injured and you know, it wasn't because you were playing football and someone broke your leg, right? Chances are most people are injured. It's because their body could not handle that, whatever they were trying to do to it. Right. And people try to train for a marathon. They just start running. Right. It's, th it's things like that. So it's like, okay, let's get you back from your injury, but then let's do it the right way and get you healthy and fit. And, you know, if you're an athlete, even up to that next level. Right. And it's, it's all a continuum and, and moving people along that spectrum. Right. Well, I, I, I love the continuum idea because a lot of people criticize chiropractors and saying, um, you know, you're just set for life. Like you got to keep going back. This dude cracks yeah. your back. You, you feel good kind of. And, but with you guys, it's not just chiropractic. It's, Hey, you're going to come back and lift weights. You're going to, you're oh, going to get, yeah, you're gonna, exactly. I'm going to help you with your diet. I'm going to help you with this. And that you, they should come back for life because exactly. you're still always getting better. You're always managing, or you're moving to a new stage of life and you're moving into your, your yeah. later years. And it's a new time now. I gotta, new I gotta, goal. Exactly. Yeah. New goals and changing. I think that's so great because it's not like a, a vampire uh, keeping their victim alive to keep sucking blood right. off them. It's like, exactly. no, we're, we're helping you. And it makes sense that you have to come back because mm -hmm. I'm providing this service continually and you're getting sure. better. Absolutely. Sure. And that, and that's why at, obviously at the beginning, when we started talking, like we were joking around, but it's like, I don't like, I don't care for the term like, oh, okay, I'm a chiropractor. Like, I don't walk around telling everybody I'm a chiropractor. Like, okay, yeah, I'm a chiropractor or a doctor, whatever you want to call me. But like, at the end of the day, that's a means. That's a means for us to be able to help the people in the way that we knew we wanted to help them, right? We knew that this is the model that we, that we think is an awesome model and, you know, needs to be a, a shift towards that model for everybody, not just us, but if we're the first ones to do it or to one of the first ones to kind of pioneer that that's awesome and being a chiropractor is a way for us to do that but it's at the end of the day it's a means and so it's like if you don't you know if you don't like chiros like okay that's yeah, cool yeah, yeah. i've had bad experience with chiropractors whatever it is i'm i'm a chiropractor but i'm not like i'm a chiropractor right? it's like i'm i'm a chiropractor because that gives me a means to help you right i'm i have the education now from school and stuff but I'm also a strength coach, right? And it's like, I don't identify more as a chiropractor than a strength coach. I'm both. Mm -hmm. And literally they're both just a means because I, I'm very confident that the model we've created is the best way to look at health and fitness. And so, you know, again, it's a means for me to move you along that spectrum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, to answer your question, I do think, you know, yeah. someone comes into our office like overweight, the, we're going to try to get them out of pain and meet and reach their goals. But the healthiest thing someone someone could do, you could make an argument like they need to do aerobic exercise, they need to do resistance training, but at the end of the day, they need to exercise and that's the healthiest thing. Every professional can agree on that. So it's absolutely going to end there, hopefully, you know, as long as they stick with it, that's where it's going to end. And sometimes it, you know, requires us to sort of be a cheerleader in the beginning, like, hey, you're doing awesome. Like, this is great. Let's keep progressing, like kind of get them excited about it. And then once they see some changes in their function and pain, then we can kind of be like, hey, let's, you know, let's keep making you healthy. Like, I get your back pain went away, but you have crippling diseases and obesity too. Like, we need to fix that as well. You and know? you already started. So let's just keep going. That's what gets exactly. me off. Like, Snowball. I Dude, I just think everyone should be lifting weights. Like, th there's there's yeah. people who yeah. who you know you're a cross country yeah. runner. Yeah. Like you should do that, but you should lift weights too. All of us should Absolutely. be making like you have this body, you have this potential. How far can you take that? Let's all do that. Let's all just be freaking lifting weights, all jacked. This would be great. Yep. I've yeah. never we've 100%. never had a patient or a client or anybody who started with us, stuck with it, right? Didn't fall off, stuck with it made changes that they wanted to see 
and regretted it. You know what I mean? Right. Like, like no one's like, oh, this wasn't worth it, right? It's like they may not have known at the time that they that it, it was worth the investment when they went into it. And maybe sometimes we do have to kind of like kind of nudge people in the right direction and be like, hey, like try this, try this. But at the end of the day, like when people stick with it, they get the results and it's because that's what our bodies were meant to do, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's not like, oh, like try this fitness program. And maybe it's like, no, we know the concepts of how our bodies work. Like we, we know a pretty good amount of, about the human body. And so it's like, apply the concepts and it works, right? Like if you are in a calorie deficit over an extended period of time, you will lose weight, right? Mm-hmm. If you are in a calorie surplus and you're lifting weights, you will get stronger. You will get bigger. Like that's not, that's not theoretical. That's what happens. Right. And so it's like, yeah, absolutely. Everybody should be lifting weights. And because, because just like we were talking about before, like our lives have become so sitting down doing these jobs. Mm -hmm. And, and if you want to go down to that, you know, our ancestors route, we didn't have jobs where we sat down and stuff. We had to hunt for food and we had to, and like, that's how humans lived for so long and civilization has developed in this short period of time if we're talking about like the cosmic scale of things and so it's like the fact that the fact that like all of a sudden in this tiny little time period our our lifestyles have changed so much and it's like adding weightlifting and and i'm not saying you have to you know hulk out at the gym and get huge but like add resistance training to cardio aerobic training whatever you like to do right you don't have to sit in the gym and be a gym rat but, but whatever you like to do, be active and resistance training is a way to get, you know, supplement that, but like do stuff that's going to keep you active and fit. Yeah. You know I mean, and like that's yeah. nobody, nobody I know that has ever implemented that stuff regrets it at all. Well, to me, to me, it's like putting in your time. So my ancestors, uh, on, on the Scottish side or ever chasing sheep all day and grabbing them, lift them over their head, toss them back in the pen. So it's like, I, I'm not going to do that all day. I got to go get an hour of chasing sheep in. I got to go like, that's what my ancestors did. They just lifted freaking, they tackled a cow or something and got them back in the thing. And then it was on to the next thing. They're carrying milk cartons. They're doing all sorts of stuff. And I'm not doing that, but my body's made to be doing that kind of stuff. So I'm going to go throw around some weight and simulate tossing a cow back into the pen. That used to be called living life. (laughs) Now we've condensed ourselves down to the computer screen. But the the one thing I was going to say, this kind of ties back to earlier is like, I always, I always get people like, Ooh, I don't want to lift too heavy. I'm going to get hurt. Or this position might hurt me. It's like every tissue that you're worried about hurting in the gym from running, from lifting, playing a sport, whatever, every tissue that you're wanting to, that you're worried about hurting will adapt to load in a positive manner. As long as it's progressed correctly. You know what I mean? Right. Tendons, ligaments, muscles, connective tissues, bones, all of that stuff will adapt positively to load. So like, there's no reason not to show it that load. Yeah. And the, the guys like, uh, so, so in college you could tell, so I was on the wrestling team, but you could tell guys in the, on the football team, you could kind of tell who took roids in high school because their tendons are snapping in weird spots. Yep. You know, they're, 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 they're snapping on their elbow and it's like, bro, that doesn't happen unless your muscles are too big for your tendons. Cause you didn't earn them. Right. Yeah. You're, you a, didn't earn them. Tendinous strength and muscle strength. Right. That large difference. Yeah. You get a lot of supposed to grow with each other. Right. right. And so when one grows faster, the other one can't. Well, right. And so right. to worry about those kind of injuries is like, yeah, it could happen in a freak accident. But if you're not juicing up, dude, you don't need to worry about your you know, triceps tendon Absolutely. snapping or something like that. And you, I mean, even like aesthetically, like my least favorite thing is like when girls say like they don't want to lift because they don't want to look big. And I'm like, first of all, I'm like, they, they'll show a picture of like a huge buff hair. Like even those girls in like the CrossFit games, like I'll tell you what, they're pretty jacked, but I'm like, lady, I've been trying to look like that my whole life. Like, and I right. like, trust me, just by lifting some weights. You know how hard it is to there? Yeah. Well, like, I'm like, I think a lot of them that, that you think it's that easy. I think <laughs> like, a lot I've of them have juiced like too. That. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of those ladies have juiced. Um, yeah. Some, some of them haven't. I don't want to take away if they haven't or anything, no. but I think a lot of them have at some point. And then, yeah, like you said, man, that's, Uh, that's something that julie learned you know julie was like yeah you know i don't know i want my triceps getting big and i told her exactly what you said it's like that's not how your body is like you start working out and even if you're training heavy you're gonna look toned you're gonna look good yeah and she's been at it and she's a beast now yeah Yeah. and and that's the thing is like it's actually the opposite of that like if you want to look good don't go run on the treadmill and lose like 
you see like skinny girls who like don't live like they, they're kind of like like that's not I mean, I'm not trying to say like what girls should or shouldn't look like, but I'm just saying like uh-uh. like They're aesthetic like aesthetically though, like having muscles like is is a good look, and like not saying it's not mm-hmm. good if you don't, but I'm just saying like it, it, can, it means you can help me chase lift. down. You can help me chase down that sheep, and right, you know, we're and like, and then you can like you can like do stuff, right? Like having no. like muscles and being strong allows you to like do fun stuff, like you know, if you're going hiking or stuff, right. and like you imagine like imagine like going like you know, on a fun trip or like, you know, going to like, you know, Puerto Rico or something and you're going like, you're doing these adventures, right? That like people like to do on their vacations, but you aren't strong enough to do some of the stuff. And it's like, you're limiting yourself to like basic life things, like being able to like hike up a trail and stuff when you're getting mm-hmm. tired after like a mile, it's like, be strong. And like, it's not that hard to like build up tissue tolerance. Like we've been talking about your body adapts pretty quickly to the, to the stressors you put on it. And so like, it, it's almost, it makes, it's, it, it blows my mind that like not everybody would want to do that, you know? Well, well and, and the, uh, you know, the, the positive attitude, attitude that comes after the gym, like the harder you work and the more exhausted you get in the gym, the better you feel afterwards. And then with that comes increased confidence in your daily life. Your shirts start fitting you differently and you're like, Oh, okay. I like that. Absolutely. I can get down with that. And it's just, it's a spiral upward instead of the spiral In downward. All, all aspects, physiologically, yeah. mentally, everything. Yeah. And, and it's not just us just bullshitting right now and talking about this stuff. It's like this, there's research that proves all this stuff, that mental health improves with, with resistance exercise and, and fitness. And, I get and it. yeah, it's yeah. like, it's not, it's not just us talking about it. There's plenty of science that backs all this up that, again, exercise is good for every aspect of your life. even from like your diet and stuff and metabolically how you respond to the nutrients that you put in your body and insulin resistance and all the stuff that we know about chronic disease. And a lot of this stuff can be traced back to like exercise and diet solves a lot of that stuff, you know, and it's, it's crazy that like people would rather live an unhealthy life and then go to the doctor and take all these meds and all this stuff. And again, modern medicine does wonders and it's, it's great that we have all this stuff that can help people when they are sick, but the best defense or the best offense is a good defense. Right. And so it's like, don't get that stuff in the first place and you're going to be such a better position later in life. Well, and so I think think a big part of it is people didn't know what was up. Like they didn't know about lifting. They didn't know that it wasn't going to make you look all roided out. They didn't know these things. And that's why I'm excited about the program that you guys are making because I love that end result of staying healthy, staying on top of it. But I also love that you guys are putting out information all the time. So if someone wanted to get a hold of you guys, if someone wanted to hear more about the the method you guys use or different training uh, examples that you guys have, like where, where can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. We're on, we're on, I mean, we have social media, we're on Instagram at synaptics performance, synaptics, S Y N A P T Y X performance. And same thing on YouTube, same name. And uh, we also have a website synapticsperformance.com. And from there you can navigate, you can see, you know, we have tons of informative videos, right? Our, our whole philosophy is like sharing the knowledge, right? So we want to give everybody the tools they can to be successful, even if they're paying us or not, right? It's like, hopefully that's enough to get them motivated to start heading down the right track. And then from there, you can trust us when you need us, right? But yeah, one, one cool thing that Ryan didn't mention about the website too, just real quick. So the YouTube has a lot of informational uh, videos on like biomechanics and you know neurophysiology, neuroanatomy, all these topics that we think are really important. We're going to keep adding to those too. But even on the website, there's like, all right, if I just click on you know shoulder. Uh, releases. I can look at, you know, my shoulder and my pecs are bugging me. What can I do to kind of loosen that up with the things I have at my house? So stuff Mm -hmm. like that. There's also an educational resources tab where you can look at research and all the kind of the main areas that we deal with. So if you ever think like, what are they talking about all this research? Like literally click there and click chiropractic care and you can see, you know, the JAMA article saying, you know, they recommend chiropractic care. Like everything we're saying is pretty much found there. So, like, if you think we're full of it, go go look at it and go read for yourself and you yeah, know, learn. We're, kind of, we're, we're adding articles to that, so we'll update our our library, our research library, and we're putting you know when we find a new interesting article or something that's relevant to you know things that we're talking about, we'll post it up there. So we're updating that, and so we like to again not just talk the talk, but have things that back up what we're saying because, like I said, we're evidence based, and you know we're not we're not just over here making claims. You know, we're following right. what modern science is is telling us. 
Yeah. So, yeah. so, um, so that's how people at a distance can get uh, a hold of you or can get uh, in on your, your, your training and your teaching. How about if, if someone lives in the Chicagoland area and wants to come check you guys out? Yeah, yeah we, we have a uh, office in Hinsdale, Illinois. Um, that's where we do a lot of our patient care and stuff. Um, but we also have um, a gym that we work out of in Lombard, Illinois called Physical Fusion Training Center. And so we do a lot of training out of there. We'll see patient visits out of there as well. So those are two areas in the Chicagoland area that people can come see us. Yeah, if you're, if you're near Chicago, obviously, you know, reach out on the website. Give us a call. We have our contact information on there. You can shoot us a message on Instagram or YouTube or whatever it is. Like, you know, yeah, we, we respond pretty quick to all the social media or email or anything, that stuff. So you're not website, get it. YouTube, Instagram, all that stuff, get in contact with us. And if you want to make an office visit or a consultation or anything like that, we offer like free consultations even because it's like, you know, a lot of people don't know what they don't know. So if you're having anything that you want to talk about in terms of training or, um, you know, patient care, we'll sit down with you without, you know, making it a whole thing yet. And if you're interested, like, okay, let's do this. So uh, we want it, we just want it to be as accessible as, as we can for everybody because we know how beneficial it'll be once they actually get on board. Yeah, dude, this is uh, we've been pretty professional this whole time. I'm, I'm surprised we held it all together. It's been wild. Pretty good. Uh, pretty good. Maybe the next think, one we'll joke around more. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm a little nervous about that. Right, let a couple of ones slip and stuff. But uh, you're an animal, uh, dudes. Thanks, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. This was really interesting. I'd love to have you guys back on to talk uh, anatomy crap, talk you know pain yeah. management, all that fun sure. stuff. Get back in that like world. Kind of just crack the surface. I could keep going. Yeah, 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 for sure. So, so let's have you guys back on. We'll we'll talk all this fun stuff. Yeah, um, yeah talking about some of your other topics too, if you want. Well, dude, so we 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 just we're on pain. Ma- pain is so interesting to me because I like looking at it from like the philosophical side. And there's some really interesting problems for philosophy of mind uh, f- from the like phenomena of pain, which is so sweet. Like mm-hmm. our pain is different than animal pain, but. Uh, it's just it's interesting. So we could we could definitely too. get back into that stuff. What's crazy too is like you ask Coach Boone what is pain and he says fresh bread, you know? <laughs> I think it's French bread. So we made yeah, we made it so close. Bread, we were so close to ending without, I'm without... a little bit of humor in there. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> well, uh we could talk about this more and someday we will, but uh, it's gonna have to do it for now. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory.